welcome. Our guest today is Dr. Supachai Panichpak, the fourth Director General of the World Trade Organization. Dr. Supachai served as DG from 2002 to 2005. Dr. Supachai, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Well, it's certainly a great delight to see you again, Keith. Let me start with, with this. You were there at the beginning of this organization. Your, your signature is on the Marrakesh Treaty, if I'm not mistaken. What did you envisage at that time, uh, and what have you seen as perhaps the most unexpected uh, development involving the WTO over these 25 years? Well, uh, that is some years ago. And if I try to recollect what happened in those days and uh, uh, what, what came to my mind most vividly, was to see how the world gradually changed in a way uh, it became more susceptible to the ideas that trade, international trade, could make a great difference to your own economy. I went to that meeting uh, in Marrakesh, uh, actually uh, not, as a, not as a trade minister, uh, at that time, I was, uh, I think, the first time as a prime as deputy prime minister, looking after uh, the Ministry of Commerce and the Commerce Ministry. Uh, Commerce Minister at that time uh, went along with me. Uh, I was sent there uh, to observe the way the new commercial regime at the global level could help to enhance economic policy making. I, I was very pleased to see that the world is coming together in a way that will be much, much more interdependent uh, in terms of the way we are going to trade with each other under a set of new rules under the World Trade Organization. The set of new rules that would like we all used to describe to be quite transparent, rule-based, and uh, the system would be non-discriminatory. And so we were very pleased to be there. And my, my, my expectation uh, and uh, what I envisaged from, from the Marrakesh meeting 1994 was that uh, we are going to have a whole world that would be more or less uh, globalized in a way that will be able to drive our multilateral trading system together for the benefits of all of us. And the, and the, the mood that I found there was, and that was a, that was a very, uh, I would say, uh, a very favorable, favorable atmosphere for the multilateral trading system. And I can see that in, the, uh, in, in these uh, 25 years, uh, the, the World Trade Organization has grown so much. I mean, in 1994, I, I recall we had something like 128 members, and now we have 164 members. That's, that's right. Yes, we have grown a lot in terms of the coverage uh, uh, of the global trading system, uh, more than 97, 98% mm -hmm. of the global trade volume is covered by the membership of the the WTO, which is something uh, very appropriate for a, for a global, for a world uh, organization like the WTO. Uh, also, the, uh, the the numbers, uh, the, the the number of issues, the uh, agenda of the organization has also grown precipitously. I think uh, it has grown from basically mainly only driven by negotiations in the areas of manufacturing sector. It has grown to encompass nearly all fields of economic involvement like agriculture, services, environment, uh, particularly interests of the vulnerable countries and development concerns and all these sort of things. So I, I think the organization has 
has grown to be uh, very diverse. Sometimes people can say that it might be so that uh, we have been taken on so much on our shoulder or not, but I think it's at the moment appropriately so mm. because we need we need actually an organization like this to be able to drive forward the multilateral now, system in a way that should be linked to the global sustainable growth. You, you've mentioned quite a lot of things there that have been added to the WTO's agenda. What would you say is the most important achievement that has been attained by the WTO during this past quarter century? In, in the intervening uh, period, uh, last 25 years, we, we, we have seen the global economy becoming so much intertwined and, and trade has become the sort of a network that has actually put us all together in a way that uh, with a rule-based system, a fair system, that we can all take part with benefits. So I have seen that because of this rule-based system, transparent, uh, non-discriminatory, we have created an orderly global system that supports, I would say, the global development together. We have been able to reduce all forms of trade barriers not only tariffs, but the kind of non-tariff barriers that used to exist before. And we have made sometimes some of the barriers uh, like uh, the uh, SPS uh, or any other forms of, of, of barriers uh, to be on a, uh, to be regulated, well regulated and agreed upon. So that uh, could be a, an orderly process of resolving some of these issues. We've seen, uh, many cases of disputes being resolved uh, in a most, uh, I would say, creditable manner. I mean, although there's been some dissatisfaction, as we all know, with the dispute settlement system as it is, but I have seen most of the time, and during the term that I serve, that we've been able to apply the DSB to the benefit of, of, of everyone with very much uh, an, an unbiased stance. Uh, Sometimes people can say it has grown to become too strong. I mean, this, the, 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 the dispute settlement system of, uh, of the WTO. But I think that is, a, that is uh, one, of the, one of the important achievements of the organization. I also saw that by having uh, the trade policy review for countries, members of the WTO from time to time, we can link the trade or trading system to the rest of the economy, to other sectors of the economy, and to the, the, the macroeconomic policies of the country, so that we would know actually whether trade has been helpful or not, and how to make trade helpful to economic development of a country, and how economic policy making could also vice versa, turn to be used to promote more trade in a, in a fairest and freest uh, possible manner. You've mentioned uh, dispute settlement. You've mentioned trade policy review, very important transparency mechanism. What about areas where we could have and should have done more? Where have we fallen short of our objective? Well, like, like I said, I mean, uh, maybe uh, throughout the years, we might have been taking up so much uh, on our shoulders, Keith. Uh, there have been a lot of issues coming to the attention of the, of the World Trade Organization, uh, issues uh, like well, geographical indications, issues like intellectual property rights, uh, uh, well, environment, uh, vulnerable economies, the uh, island state economies, LDCs, uh, all, all kinds of, of issues that 
that has been heaped on the shoulders of the WTO. And so we, we, we I, I don't know whether we have actually fallen short of the expectation of us or, or maybe because we have been assigned to do so many things at the same time. And yeah. we might have not been established to do all these things at the same time. When I compare the uh, kind of uh, great efficiency that we've seen with a system of dispute settlement and compare it to the less efficient rules making exercises, procedures through negotiations. Right. When, when the process of, of, uh, of judiciary becomes so strong and the process of rule making become a little bit less strong, then you can see, you see, he said the pressure uh, is being exerted on the organization uh, to sort of legislate new rules instead of having yeah. new rules being negotiated and agree among the members. Yeah. Sometime through adjudication, we have come to interpret certain agreements, certain rules in a way that's not supposed to be. Well, you, you've talked about having all of these issues to a certain extent thrust upon us. But as you know well, the issue of WTO reform is very prominent right now. Some people believe it means taking on more issues, e-commerce, for example, investment facilitation, yeah. women's economic empowerment. There's, there's lots and lots of different ideas out there, and it seems every member has a different idea. What, what do you think? Well, how should the WTO reform? Well, before, before I left, uh, the organization in 2005, uh, you remember Keith, I actually uh, set up a con consultative uh, committee that I asked uh, uh, our former uh, Director General Peter Sutton to share. That's right. And, and, uh, and, uh, and to produce a report on the future of the WTO, which was uh, published more or less coinciding with the 10th anniversary of uh, of the WTO in 2005. I, I look at some of the, uh, the, the recent articles uh, talking about reform. Some of the articles uh, even refer to this report. Well, some not always in the, in the most favorable ways, but it, at least the report has, <laughs> has, has, provoked, has provoked some discussions on, on what should be done. Uh, I, just, I just would like to touch upon that a, a bit briefly. Uh, firstly, uh, in that report, we, we, try to, we try to emphasize the need for the organization to be, to be based on the, on the principle of consensus. Yeah. But we also make clear in that report that consensus will have to be modified a little bit. For key issues, for important issues, must be consensus. But for what we call less important issues and procedural matters, maybe consensus is not needed. For example, this is one of the things we, we propose. We also propose that uh, the secretariat be made stronger uh, and the role of the secretary general, of the director general of the organization also be made more, more fortified, more pronounced. For example, that he should be, well, not only leading the negotiations uh, uh, sessions committees, but maybe to share the general counsel, and also for the whole secretariat to take a leading role more in determining the kind of uh, proposed agreements or proposed directions for the organization to move forward. In the report also, uh, we talk about the need to have more linkages between the Geneva process and the capitals. So I suggested, we suggested in that report that there should be a sort of a consultative board at a senior level, meeting on a regular basis, a few times per year, so that the DG can use that consultative board to connect with the senior officials or ministers at the at capital. Mm. Which I thought in those days that would probably have been a better arrangement than just having many ministerials. Yeah. Because many ministerials are sometimes too confined now, these are some of the, some of the past uh, considerations that I have uh, put into that, that report, but 
to, to be looking at the, at the present situation, uh, uh, the, the reform that, that comes to mind uh, that, that is certainly uh, needed is really, again, uh, to make our organization meaningful, to have, to have a role that is accepted by the global community that, that, that we can help to play. Well, we need to, to be able to move together uh, with, 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 with the tide. I mean, uh, uh, at, at, at the moment, uh, we are seeing changes going around the world and uh, uh, in, in, in terms that, uh, well, uh, the rise of Asia is, is very much pronounced. Uh, we're seeing a sort of a deglobalizing trend coming up. So the WTO together with the major multilateral organization around the world may need to be able to sit together to determine the future directions of the globalization process. Mm. We cannot allow this globalization process to just drift along. The threat from the environment is becoming more and more real. The threats from pandemics, even more real and just with us at present. And the kind of food security issue that we're seeing around the world is going to crop up time and again. I think we need to, to sit down with uh, multilateral organizations around the world together with the WTO to be able to, to, to determine the kind, of, the kind of future of the world that we, we need to have. Let's say partnership, partnership in managing the global governance. That is one of the one of the targets in the uh, in the sustainable development goals of the UN. That has to be something which is real. That we have partnership from all parts of the world, and this has to be reformed. This has to be Im embedded in, uh, in into the into the into the WTO. You, we need you... to be able to uh, uh, to to look into. Uh, the real need of, of the situation at the moment, for example, in the areas of uh, dealing with pandemics, that we cannot always uh, apply what is it, the, 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 the TRIPS agreement uh, as, as we used to do. We, we have to be more flexible as what we have done to amend it so that when we produce a kind of vaccine and medicine for this pandemic coronavirus, we can distribute it around the world for free. Yeah. For, for, for the minimum of cost and things like that. Yes. So we need a system, uh, we need a system that is in tune with the requirement of the present situation around the world. We need also to be able to reform the system, to move forward, to, to do what you've been doing at the, uh, the organization at the moment, which is to look at the trade related rule making exercise with digital economy. I think that is, that is very much needed because we are seeing the, 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 the power, the, the dominant power of, of some of the key digital players around the world that are not, are not under any, any sort of control by anybody and not supervised mm. fully. And, and, and mm. you know, it, it is a problem with, with the, the consumer's protection as well. So we need to be able to link uh, that together. And, and we need also to link up our work really uh, on, on environment, on our on environment. Environment is a real issue. It's not going to be used as a trade restrictive measures, but we have to be able to understand how trade can promote environmental concerns, uh, preservation and things like that. And, and vice versa, uh, environment should not become the kind of uh, excuse uh, for us to limit trade. You, you've touched on a, on a very large number of issues that, that have a highly political element to them. If you look at polling, it seems that in virtually every country of the world, you will see positive responses to the question of trade. And yet, what you have seen in terms of government response to trade, and you've spoken about this quite a lot recently, is moving in the other direction, away from trade, protectionism, deglobalization. Why has this seemingly positive polling situation not translated into political impetus to get the trading system going f firmly and, and uh, powerfully again? I, I think the problem, the problem 
with the world economy, even before the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, Keith, was, was that we could not cope very well with the, the problems of demand def deflation. Before the last, let's say, 10, 20 years, we were used to, deal, to dealing with the inflationary impact coming from the rises in oil prices, commodity prices, and then, you know, we become so much used to do it uh, in a way that we, 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 we use so much restrictive measures to contain inflationary impact. So much so that we have actually not been able to, to apply the kind of measures that would deal with the deflationary situation which took place in the last couple of decades and uh, accurated by some crisis around the world. Because of this deflation, everybody turns toward a new economic theory that you don't do trade because trade has been actually impacted a lot because of the deflationary impact. People walk away from trade. They look at their own domestic economy and they said, okay, we have to balance trade with our own internal demand stimulus, domestic demand stimulus. So more or less by sheer impact from the crisis to be more austere because of demographic aging society, uh, we, have, we have turned to become more reliant on domestic demand policy making. We have to have domestic demand, but we have to have a balance between external and and domestic demand. Because I have seen with every crisis in the world in the past 20, 30 years, that without actually the revival of international trade, we cannot really come out of any real crisis. We've been looking at, at big picture topics right now. Let me shift to your specific time here at the WTO. What would you say was your most significant achievement as Director General? That is the time that we've been able to rally uh, the active participation of all countries around the world, particularly the poor economies, the developing countries. Because I thought before that time when I came to the WTO, it was more or less, I don't want to call it a rich man club, which is uh, maybe a misnomer, but, but the participation at the global level, global trading system was rather limited. There was no conviction that trade could help to alleviate poverty and could lead into more development and growth and things like that. I, I, I think the, the, the achievement that I, I would be proud of is the achievement that we have reactivated the kind of linkages between trade and development in the way that there have been groups of European countries that have been created that I fully supported so that they can take part actively in trade negotiation. There have been, there have been training courses that we have set out in, 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 in numerous cases so that we can help to build up the uh, domestic uh, capacity, uh, supply capacity, productive capacity to help people to be competitive uh, by also uh, uh, restructuring our secretariat a little bit in the way that I place more emphasis on development putting up the unit for the LDCs, but I link that all to the, the, the effort to link between trade and development as, as clear as possible, because trade is not always helpful, conducive all the time. There are yeah. cases that, that trade can also bring about a lot of uh, negative impact. So trade must be managed in a way that uh, you must link it to the competitiveness of the country. What was your, your biggest challenge, your, your, your toughest moment? What was the time when, uh, when you said, boy, this is really, we're, we're really in a mess now? Was there a time like that? Well, you see, the Cancun <laughs> moment, the Cancun Ministerial Conference was my only Ministerial Conference uh, in my three-year term. That was the fifth MC. I remember. And I, I, I ideally wanted the Cancun MC to be as successful as possible, Keith. Yeah. I made a lot of preparations. I was so pleased that 
we could agree on the uh, uh, amendments uh, on the waiver for the uh, application of trips for for, for public health purposes health, before we right. went to Cancun. Do you that's remember right. that? I, I thought do. I was. I thought we had the wind in our sail to go to Cancun, and 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 produce some results. And yet, yet when I <laughs> when I found myself at Cancun and, and together with all the membership there, I was I was uh, let down completely. I was let down completely. I was very pleased to see the emergence of strong developing country present. Jagdish Bhagwati told me later that Cancun was a moment that we saw the emergence of a really strong, active participation, political weight of the of the, the, the open countries, uh, members yeah. of the WTO. And I was very pleased with that. But on the other hand, my anxious moment, my, my concern, my sleepless nights uh, were due to the, 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 the things, the thing that I, I saw every day that the, the two big groups of developed economies and developing member countries are drifting way and way apart. Yeah. Although all the work I've been doing before Cancun has been trying to bring them together. And, and at Cancun, they were drifting apart in agriculture, in Nama. I brought up the issues of cotton, you remember? I do. Be because I thought cotton would bring developing countries around to the package because cotton is, a, is, is symbolic to me because cotton is for the poorest economies in Africa. Yeah. If we can deal, uh, do a good deal for cotton, then we, we can bring all the developing countries around uh, to move more and the developed countries also to move because cotton is about elimination yeah. of, of impediments to trade. It's not asking for any special help. It's just in line with what the WTO is all about, is to eradicate, eradicate impediments to trade. And yet cotton was an issue that has caused me sleepless nights. And I, I, I have nights which I went on the phones to talk with heads of delegation one to three o'clock in the night to, to try to convince them on, on certain passage. I, and I, 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 together with, of course, all our colleagues there, we create a passage for cotton, uh, which got criticism from all sides. But so I, I was very much that let usually down. means you have it pretty well correct. When everyone's criticizing you, that means you've found the sweet spot. Yeah, that's what I, <laughs> yes. That must have been the sweetest spot because it was a very heavy yeah. bunch of criticism is, coming is down. Is that why Cancun fell apart, do you think, on cotton? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe cotton was raised because uh, there was another power moment when I could I could uh, invite uh, President I think uh, Campos Blas Campos from Campores, yes, that's right. Com Com you remember uh, from Burkina Faso to come to our yep. general council meeting and and ask him to to make an expose on his cotton issue thing you know and and I was proud that at the end of that meeting everybody voted in favor of having cotton and I I thought I was instrumental in bringing that around and so cotton yes, was brought outside of the DDA, of the Doha agenda, to become part of it. And so I, I know it was an uphill fight, but, but I, I was very proud to be part of it. And it has given me a lot of anxious moments, but a lot of proud moments. Let me ask you one final, que one final question. I mentioned to you earlier, before we went to film, that we uh, are advancing very rapidly towards choosing our next director general. If there was one single piece of advice you could give to her, what would that piece of advice be? I, I, I would go back to uh, one of my, of, of, of the consultative bodies advice in the, in the report, the, the future of the WTO, which is to try to, to support and strengthen our secretariat, Keith. This is, like I said, this is, this is a, a, a rudderless world. It is a globalizing world that is not moving in a in a in a concerted direction. It's 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 going everywhere. It's you know. It, so we, we need we need a strong executive branch, uh, secretariat, secretariat, which has not always been supported fully, uh, as I could see during my time, because we were we were. <laughs> Very, very restricted in, in our budget, in the way we could do things that would be outside of the member-driven organization to say things that we could not, were not allowed to say and things like that. 
I think my my single advice would be to do to do your best to do her best to to strengthen the secretariat because the secretariat could help give more direction. Secretariat has all the research statistics, has a know-how, you know, it's institutional memory, institutional memory. So so my my advice would be to to strengthen secretariat and try to convince this member-driven organization that it could be member-driven, I don't mind that, but member-driven should be driven in the same direction, <laughs> not di driven in all directions that we cannot, <laughs> can, can, cannot find our way, get lost, yeah. get lost, yeah. and, and, and would, would be of, of benefits to no one. Dr. Supachai, it's been a great pleasure catching up with you. All the very best, and thank you very much for taking your time to speak with us this afternoon. Well, it has been great talking to you again, Keith. Nice to see you nice safe see and sound. You. And I hope every one of our friends and colleagues at the uh, office in Geneva is in the same shape as you are. Thank you, Dr. Supachai. Thank you very much. Nice talking to you. We've been talking with Supachai Panichpak, the Director General of the WTO between 2002 and 2005 the fourth director general of our organization.